Good afternoon and welcome to the Bureau of Justice Assistance Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding Grantee Training. My name is Brittany Bruner and I am contract support for the Bureau of Justice Assistance National Training and Technical Assistance Center. Please note that this session is being recorded. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A feature rather than the chat feature. If we do not get to your question, we will follow up after the presentation. I will now turn it over to Kendall Ehrlich, Director of the SMART Office and Acting Director of the Bureau of Justice Assistance for opening remarks. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding Grantee Training Webinar. As stated, my name is Kendall Ehrlich, and I'm the Acting Director of the Bureau of Justice Assistance at the Office of Justice Programs within DOJ. I also serve as the director of the OJP SMART office. Thank you for taking the time today out of your busy schedules to join us for this training webinar. We have an exciting agenda for you, which includes an overview of post-award grant management topics, updates on reporting requirements, and a just grants demonstration. I want to acknowledge the personal and professional challenges we are all facing as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Beyond keeping ourselves and our families safe, we also have a duty and an obligation to keep our staff and our community safe. And I applaud all of you for your efforts with managing these priorities. I would also like to tell you how proud I am of my BJA team, who worked around the clock to ensure that this emergency funding was distributed as soon as possible. BJA posted the funding announcements the business day following the passage of the CARES Act and started making grant awards within that same week. 99% of the CSEF funds were distributed by mid-June, which was an amazing feat and a true testament to BJA's commitment to the field. So I hope you enjoy this webinar and I look forward to our continued partnership. Next up, we have Darius Locicero, Lo Lo sorry about that, Darius, Division Chief, of our Southeast region in BJA's great program office. Take it away, Darius. Thanks, Kendall, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Darius Lucisro, and I am a division chief at the BJA program's office. I'm also a senior lead for the CESF program. Uh, you will also today be hearing from Teresa Napolitano, who is the state policy advisor and also the program lead for the CESF program. James Stey, who uh, works with our performance measurement team, will go over reporting, and Bethany Case and Amy Callahan, who are part of our Just Grants uh, team. Just to briefly go over the agenda with you, uh, I will be touching on the assessive overview for everyone and then passing along to Teresa, who's going to go over program requirements, some grants management overview items, and will provide some examples of state and local challenges. Then there will be a presentation on reporting, followed by a demonstration of uh, just grants, and uh, then some time for questions and answers. Just to start off with uh, BJA's mission, uh, BJA provides leadership and services and grant administration and criminal justice policy development to support local, state, and tribal justice strategies to reduce violent crime and strengthen communities. As uh, always, you can find out more about BJ on our website, as well as uh, our Facebook page, both of which will be uh, linked to in the slides that you receive after the presentation. To give you an overview of the CESF program, uh, Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, or CARES Act, included $850 million for state and local law enforcement assistance to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus domestically or internationally to be awarded pursuant to a formula allocation, the same formula allocation that was used for the 2019 JAG awards. Uh, BJA made a total of 1,828 CESF awards, totaling over 847.7 million. Award funds uh, must be utilized to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus and just important to note that CESIF is not JAG, and as such, a criminal justice nexus is not required. CESIF allocation amounts were calculated by multiplying each FY19 JAG direct allocation by 3.2196%, or 
which was a proportionate increase in sets of funding as compared to the FY19 JAG funding. And as I previously said, if you were eligible for JAG, you were eligible for CESF. Uh, each JAG disparate jurisdiction was eligible to apply directly. Uh, so there's no disparity under the CESF program, which is why that was the case. Each JAG zero county was eligible for 58,008, which was derived by taking the overall total set aside from the less than 10,000 amounts under FY19 JAG, and that was a little over 20.3 million, and dividing up by 351, which is the number of zero counties. And this was to ensure that everyone would actually get some of the critical funding that was needed. Just to show everybody an example of uh, a disparate jurisdiction from 2019. Uh, this one was taken from Alabama. And you can see here under JAG, there was a joint allocation that Mobile County, Mobile City, and Pritchard City applied for uh, together. Uh, that was $169,327. But under CESF, each one of those jurisdictions was eligible to apply directly because there's no disparity and once again, those allocations were increased by 3.22196%. Uh, under CESAS, allowable projects and purchases can include, but not limited to, overtime equipment, including law enforcement, medical personnel, protective equipment, hiring supplies, things like gloves, masks, sanitizer, training, travel expenses, and addressing medical needs of inmates in state, local, and tribal prisons, jails, and detention centers. As you know uh, by now, the project period by CESF is 24 months with an opportunity for a 12-month no-cost extension. Uh, the grant start date on the awards is retroactive going back to January 20th of 2020. And uh, it's very important that grantees be cognizant of supplanting, which the DOJ financial guide uh, defines as deliberately reducing state or local funds because of the existence of federal funds, for example, if the state would appropriate uh, funds for a purpose and then federal funds would be used for that same purpose, if the state replaces its state funds with federal funds, that would be supplanting. Uh, I am now going to pass it over to Teresa, who is going to go through the programmatic requirements and some grant management items for everyone. Thanks. Thank you so much, Darius. Hold on one second, let me just make sure I get the copy of the slides so that I can advance them. Um, hold on. Okay, got it. So thank you for that overview, Darius. And now we're gonna take a deeper dive into the program requirements um, under CESIS. So. As you are probably already aware, no more than 10% of the total award amount can be used for administrative purposes. However, recipients can use their full indirect cost rate agreements if they have one. So if you have an indirect cost rate under CESIS, you can use the full percentage of that agreed upon indirect cost rate. Uh, the Office of Justice Program suspended the requirements for CESIS grant recipients to receive prior approval before making a subaward. So under CESIS, subawards can be made without prior approval, which is new if you're used to JAG or any other DOJ grantee grant, actually. Um, grant recipients may draw down funds in advance or on a reimbursement basis. So if you're drawing down in advance, grant funds must be placed in an interest-bearing account. It is not necessary that the interest-bearing account be a trust fund like in JAG. And the account must, off, must allow for sufficient tracking and traceability of CESIS award funds. And any interest earned should be treated as program income and reported on the FFR, the Federal Financial Report. Any unused program income should be deobligated once the award is closed. There are no specific prohibitions under the under CESIS program other than unallowable costs that are identified in the DOJ financial guide. However, there are two items that do require prior approval, um, and we'll touch on each of those here. So the first is the individual items costing over $500,000. Um, you must submit that request 
for any item that's going to be over that threshold amount through a GAM, a grant award modification in just grant. Um, it should have a, a thoroughly justified and reasonable justification attached to that request. The second is unmanned aircraft systems or UAS or UAVs um, may not be purchased with SESA funds until BJA has provided prior approval via a GAM. So um, OGP actually recently published a policy regarding these grant funds associated with UAVs and that link is provided here. Um, and just so you're aware, I don't know if we've mentioned this already, but this presentation will be emailed out. So if you if you would like access to these links and, um, and need to use this as a resource, we certainly will make sure that you get that. So, um, but if you need to access or have questions about the UAV policy, you can find it here. Um, and you can also refer, if you have questions on how to submit these types of requests, you can also refer to the specific FAQs linked at the um, third bullet below. So now we're kind of going to shift into post-award grant management, and we're going to touch on some um, various topics here, um, including special conditions, programmatic and financial reporting, financial management, federal reporting requirements, um, for, like the FATA, grant award modifications, sub-awards and procurement, sub-recipient management and monitoring, grant monitoring and compliance, and fraud prevention. Special conditions. So special conditions are actually terms and conditions on your grant award and are included in your signed award package. Special conditions are additional requirements covering areas such as programmatic and financial reporting, prohibited uses of federal funds, consultant rates, and proper disposition of program income. There are several mandatory special conditions that are included on all DOJ awards and a list of those mandatory special conditions can be found at the link here. There are also additional withholding special conditions that can be added to your award. These conditions place holds on your funds for things such as overdue reports, pending budget approvals, or other program requirements such as incomplete documentation. So it's, of course, important that you work with your grant manager to remove any active withholding special conditions so that your agency can expend and draw down funds and begin your project activities. And for a link, if you'd like to see, if you don't, if you're not already aware, you can access and find out who your grant manager is through the link uh, below. Now we're going to review some of the reporting requirements under CESIF. Um, I'll briefly touch on the programmatic reporting here, but um, we will be covering it more in depth later in the presentation. So the programmatic reports are submitted semi-annually in Just Grants, and the link for Just Grants is here if you do not already have that. Um, and these semi-annual reports are due January 30th and July 30th. Final progress reports are due within 90 days of the award end date and must be approved prior to a closeout package being submitted. So the final progress report needs to be approved before you can close the award out. Also note that Just Grants automatically freezes funds for delinquent reports. So it's extremely important to submit your reports on time and late reports also influence how your award risk is assessed at BJA. So definitely important to make sure that your reporting is current and timely. Federal, the second type of reporting is the federal financial reports, also known as the SF-425. Um, obviously, this focuses on the financial aspects of the award. Um, these reports are due quarterly in just grants, and you can see the reporting periods listed here and their due dates. Um, so as I mentioned, they are submitted in just grants. Um, if you have no activity for the quarter, you can simply enter zero for that in the, in the corresponding fields for that quarter. And if you need help or assistance in completing these reports, or if you have questions about making amendments, um, feel free to reach out to our um, OCFO office, either by phone or email listed here. 
So grant financial management training is a new requirement. Um, I say new like in the last few years for all OJP awards. Um, this is also a special condition on your award. So um, this training is required for grant award administrators, also or formerly known as POCs, and financial managers, or previously known as FPOCs. Uh, the the uh, grant award administrator and the financial manager must complete the training within 120 days of grant acceptance. Uh, failure to comply will result in a withholding special condition, so uh, definitely important to make sure that you're, uh, you're current on this training. Um, it must be completed every three years, so if you're in that fourth year, it's important to know that and to complete the training. And it can be found with the link here. Um, and once you complete the training, you will get a certificate. Uh, please email that certificate to your grant manager and they will make sure that they upload it to your award file in Just Grants. So FATA reporting. So this is reporting that is, uh, only, that is only pertaining to those that have subawards of greater than 25,000. If you do plan on have, if you do have a subaward greater than twenty five thousand, you will be required to report at the end of the month following the making of that subaward. Um, the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act, also known as FFATA, requires the information on federal awards to be made available to the public via a single searchable website, which can be found here at USAspending.gov. The FAFATA reporting system is used to capture and report subaward and executive compensation data regarding first tier subawards, and they, we can meet those reporting requirements at this, this, the FSRS link here. Um, so, as I mentioned before, if you're a, a prime recipient and your award is greater than 25,000 and you're making subawards greater than 25,000, then you, you must meet this requirement of reporting in FAFATA for each subaward. So if you make multiple subawards greater than 25,000, you will have to report each of those into the FAFATA system. And to help you navigate uh, this process, if you have questions, there are, we do have information on user guides, FAQs, help desk, and online demos that can be accessed um, at the links below. Grant award modifications or GAMs. We briefly touched on this before. Uh, a GAM is used to request any kind of project changes or corrections to your grant award. GAMs are submitted and approved through just grants. Um, and any of the changes of the, that are included in GAMs are a change of project scope, a project period change, a sole source change, which would be anything over 250,000. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, or a programmatic cost change. GAMs will not be approved if the grantee is delinquent on any financial or programmatic reporting. So again, reporting, staying current on reporting is extremely important if you want to move forward and progress on your awards and get certain changes approved quickly. So the, the no cost extension GAM or change of project period GAM must be requested through just grants at least 30 days prior to the current end date. So generally, no more than one no-cost extension will be approved per award. I know that with COVID, we have had some extenuating circumstances, but generally speaking, this is the rule of thumb. Um, also, a no-cost extension may not exceed 12 months past the original end date. It's also important to note that it that a uh, no-cost extension will not be will be considered only if the period of performance has not expired. And a no-cost extension will be considered only for award recipients that have no significant performance or compliance issues. Subawards and procurement contracts. So I had mentioned this earlier in a previous slide that um, that OJP had suspended the requirements for CESIS grant recipients to receive prior approval before making a subaward. However, if you do need general guidance on 
how to make a subaward or some of the regulations and guidance surrounding making those types of contracts or awards, you can find some resources listed here at the links below. Uh, so, um, grantees must determine if the pass-through funds are considered sub-awards or procurement contracts. So, this is a, an important distinction. Proper determination is critical because different requirements apply to entities based on determination. Sub-awards are, are subject to, sub to monitoring by the recipient, so that's an important distinction. Also, the the substance of the relationship is more important than the form of the agreement between the prime recipient and the outside entity. The following guidance will help clarify the differences between subawards and a procurement contract. So if you're having difficulty making the distinction between the two, um, you can um, access any of the four resources below. We have a toolkit for OJP recipients. We have a checklist to determine subrecipient or contractor classification. Uh, we also have a sole source justification fact sheet and checklist, and we have the link below that can, that where you can access these resources. Continuing with procurement, so um, if we have, we do receive um, questions about procurement contracts and how, and um, the guidance for making for procurement. Um, so states must follow the same policies and procedures they use for procurement from their non-federal funds. So whatever policies or procedures the state has in place for non-federal funds would still hold true for the federal funds. And the same holds true with non-federal entities. They should be including subrecipients of the state. They must follow the guidance laid out in the 2 CFR 200. Um, if you have any questions, please refer to the DOJ Financial Guide listed here. We have a section on, a, on um, procurement procedures. And also feel free to reach out to your grant manager with any questions. They can certainly help guide you through the process. Um, so requirements to submit a sole source request. Um, so this can be um, uh, a bit of an arduous task sometimes to see all that's required, but um, we lay it all very methodically out here, and we also have it um, laid out in the financial guide. Um, so hopefully it makes the process a little easier. Um, so all procurement transactions must be conducted in a manner to provide the maximum extent practical, open, and free competition. So recipients may submit a sole source request when one or more of the following circumstances apply. The item or service is available from only one source. There is a public emergency for the requirement that will not permit a delay resulting from competitive solicitation, or the competition is determined in inadequate after the solicitation of a number of sources. So any of those circumstances would qualify for a sole source uh, request. Recipients must request and receive written approval from OJP via a GAM prior to purchasing, obligating funding, or entering into a contract related to sole source procurement in excess of the simplified acquisition threshold that's currently set at 250,000. So anything over 250,000 must be, must be submitted via a GAM and just grant for approval before moving forward. Anything under that threshold does not require prior approval from BJA. However, you still must follow the requirements set forth in the in the DOJ financial guide. And like I said, all of that information is laid out in the financial guide if you would like more information. Subrecipient management and monitoring requirements. So if you do have a subrecipient, it's important to know some of the requirements in managing that subrecipient. Recipients must have written, written subrecipient monitoring policies and procedures that meet the requirements under 2CFR. 200. Um, the purpose of monitoring activities is to provide assurance that the subrecipient has administered the pass-through funding in compliance with the same laws, regulations, and, purpose, and provisions of the award, and that performance goals are being achieved. So 
Some key components of effective subrecipient or subaward monitoring include a subaward agreement that specifies award conditions and requires progress in financial reporting, as well as possible noncompliance penalties and determination procedures. Another, another key component is monitoring policies and procedures and a risk-based monitoring plan for selecting subrecipients to monitor. And also, it should include a process for on-site monitoring, um, including a monitoring checklist that satisfies administrative, financial, and programmatic elements, a process for documenting findings in a report, and procedures for follow-up on issues for resolution. Now we'll kind of shift into BJA compliance monitoring. So these are um, BJA, BJA's direct awards monitoring. Um, so BJA will conduct formal monitoring activities via site visits and desk reviews this year for grant recipients to ensure um, that grantees are conducting activities that were proposed and approved in the original application, that they're meeting programmatic administrative and fiscal requirements, uh, that they're identifying and resolving problems and our issues that have, that have arose during the um, grant process, and that they're also receiving any needed training or guidance. Uh, different types of documentation that you would expect to be collected at a, during a monitoring visit would include things such as timesheets, copies of contracts, subrecipient agreements, overtime approvals, invoices, purchase orders, meeting agendas, general ledgers, et cetera. There's um, a wide variety of different documentation that could be collected during a site visit. Um, and really it would be, it's, it's only applicable to the type of activities that you're, you're doing in your grant award. Um, so um, I would say, suffice it to say that whatever program activities that you're conducting in your award, I would be prepared to have supporting documentation to support those activities that are being conducted. And um, also important to note that this year we are conducting enhanced programmatic desk reviews. They're called EPDRs. These are um, online, not in person. So these are virtual um, visits where we will either be engaging over the phone via conference, uh, phone conference or via tele web um, like we're doing now with through a WebEx or Zoom meeting. Um, some common issues that we've identified for resolution through our monitoring is um, we've noticed a lack of subrecipient monitoring policies and procedures that meet the requirements of 2 CFR 200. Um, another common um, issue is not submitting GAMs pri for prior approval um, for some of the award changes that were made, such as scope, budget, and contact information. Um, we've also seen lack of compliance with the FATA reporting requirements, which um, we just touched on previously. Uh, we've also seen a lack of documentation to support program activities and expenditures or documentation to support programmatic and financial reporting. So those are just some common issues that we find. Um, but again, I think more than not, we don't find issues for resolution, but when we do, these are the most common. So with the increase of stimula funding via the CARES Act, we've also seen an increase in fraudulent, um, in fraudulent activity as well. So we wanted to make you aware that criminals are attempting to exploit COVID-19 worldwide through a variety of scams. Um, throughout the country, federal, state, and local law enforcement are on high alert to investigate reports of individuals and businesses engaging in a wide range of fraudulent and criminal behavior related to COVID-19. Some of the examples of the fraud schemes that have been identified can be found at the link here. And we also have an infographic here that kind of touches on some of the key areas that had been identified in an OIG report. And the link is below as well if you would like to access that report and kind of take a deeper dive into some of the areas that were identified here. But just to touch on a couple, we have fraudulent sales of medical equipment. We've seen a risk of cryptocurrency scams, um, online scams. We've seen um, emerging healthcare fraud schemes. So definitely a wide array of fraudulent activity. 
And with that, I just have a couple slides left here um, before I hand it off. Um, and these are just some challenges that we've noticed emerge due to, due to the pandemic, not necessarily um, due to the funding necessarily, um, although some is, but um, just challenges that have, ar of, that have arisen due to the pandemic. Um, at the state level, we've seen um, a need to rapidly and significantly reduce prison and jail populations due to COVID. We've also seen challenges balancing SESA funds with other CARES Act funds and trying to um, juggle and balance the different funding streams via the CARES Act and making sure that they don't overlap and that they're not, that the planting isn't taking place at a subrecipient level. We've also seen rise in equipment costs. Certain types of equipment have increased, such as plexiglass, We've also seen local municipalities trying to coordinate response efforts with available sources of funding. Um, as most of you are aware, with um, the protests and riots, um, there have been events in response to the public health orders that restrict business operations and group gatherings, create, which created a need for new solutions to limit the spread of coronavirus during these events. So that also posed challenges. Um, we've also seen a large need for technology in comparison to PPE, um, which many agencies were able to get from grants and donations and such. Um, we all, at the state level, we've seen public defenders need tech solution to have privacy and video conferencing capabilities in local jails. We've seen justice system professionals um, unable to access uh, all the records that they needed in a work from home environment. So the, the technology, definitely posed its own challenges. And obviously budget shortfalls, who could have foreseen the impact that would have had, that this would have had on this, on the um, state level, um, both um, with length and level, um, it's had a huge economic impact. And at the local level, we've seen many of the same challenges emerge. Um, so there's quite a lot of overlap here at the local level. With budget shortfalls, we've seen unanticipated expenses due to the pandemic that were not accounted for in the local budget. Um, we, the PPE, as we mentioned before, needing equipment to address the pandemic safely was unable to be purchased due to a backlog of products. Um, first responders, we, the law enforcement and other first responders working overtime and not having the equipment or funding in the budget to cover the cost. Uh, Technology just with the with the state uh, an increased need for laptops, cameras, cell phones, and other technology just to meet the growing need to work remotely in, an, in a remote environment. We've also experienced an influx of new grantees. As Darius had mentioned, we had administered many more direct awards because of the there is no disparity in CESIF. So we have a lot of new grantees that are trying to learn how to administer grants for the first time and are also trying to learn a new federal grants and financial system. And I think a lot of us are in the same boat in trying to learn a just grant system as well, um, which we'll get into a little bit later. And um, lastly, the CESIF and JAG differences, um, learning the program and what funds could be used for. Um, Obviously in COVID, for, or for CESIF, there has to be a COVID nexus, but many of our grantees were used to JAG and there had to be a criminal justice nexus. So kind of trying to iron out those uh, issues as well. So um, as you can see, there are, uh, there, this funding did, did come with its challenges. Um, however, we have seen many states and locals working together to meet these challenges. And, BJA has also provided resources to kind of help navigate um, these uncharted waters and, and this program and funding. So, um, and we hopefully are gonna cover all of that here for you today. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague, Jimmy Dye, um, who is our expert on all things performance uh, reporting and is part of the performance measurement team. Thank you, Teresa, uh, for all that great information. And um, like you said, my name is Jimmy Stye, and I am a, a deputy task lead for the planning performance and impact team. Um, looks like I can advance slides here, so let me give it a try. All right, great. 
Um, so this present presentation will cover several topics related to performance management at the Bureau of Justice Assistance. We will discuss requirements for data reporting, including what you need to report, where reporting happens, when reporting is due throughout the year, and how to report data. Specifics around the questions you will be required to answer and some suggestions on how to improve your narrative progress reports, such as goal setting best practices. This presentation will also briefly describe some of the narrative data that has already been reported. Finally, we will share contact information and resources for you to get in touch with us if you need assistance with your performance measures or reporting at any time. Performance management is a process by which grantees regularly collect data on their grant activities or determine, or, and to determine whether they are implementing activities as intended and achieving their desired goals and objectives. Using performance measures that capture inputs, outputs, and outcomes over time enables pre and post comparisons that can be used to assess change. BJA has established performance measures or questionnaires for each grant program. These measures were included in the original solicitation that you responded to. We will also review the specifics of your program's unique questionnaire during this orientation. You can find additional information and several resources on the OJP Grant Performance Management and Progress Reporting Information Portal at the uh, website listed. Performance measures have many purposes and benefits to your program and for BJA. They allow BJA to look at your program holistically as well as at the local level to identify areas of success as well as potential opportunities for improvement. This also allows BJA to target training and technical assistance resources to subjects or localities that need them the most. Furthermore, BJA routinely receives data calls and requests, comes from Congress or the White House, and relies primarily on the data provided by grantees during reporting periods to respond to these inquiries. BJA and OJP regularly track progress toward goals and reports annual key performance indicators to leadership during budget formulation, as well as ongoing yearly monitoring. Lastly, DOJ is required to comply with re reporting requirements of federal laws, including the Government Performance and Results Act, or GIPRA, the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act, or the Data Act, and the Grant Reporting Efficiency and Agreement, or the GREAT Act. Uh, law of 2019. There are two required types of data that you, that you will report, quantitative and narrative questions. Starting new in January 2021, two additional questions related to hiring have been added. A series of narrative questions related to the grantee's specific goals, objectives, barriers, and successes are also required for grantees to report, to be reported in January and July and prior to close out. The new Just Grant system has an integrated performance reporting module where you will find online questionnaire, an online questionnaire designed to collect grantee performance data for the CSA program. The questionnaire will be required semi-annually, again in January and July of each year. The first CSIF report due in Just Grants will be the October through December reporting period which is due in January 2021. So that you are all aware, there is a known Just Grants bug that seems to be impacting grantees that accepted awards after June 30th, 2020. It is showing a phantom report due, which may be holding up funds. The Just Grants team is working on it. This phantom report is not actually due, and additional bugs have been identified that may impact reporting in the future. Lastly, I wanted to note that the Office of Management and Budget has issued OJP guidance for the implementation of the CARES Act with regard to subaward reporting for large covered funds. To comply with the CARES Act reporting requirements for subawards, prime recipients are to continue to report subaward information in FAFATA, as discussed before, for uh, subawards that would fall under the large covered funds. Uh, OJP or BJA will be providing additional written guidance on this in the near future, so please stay tuned for that. A PDF version of the CSIF questionnaire can be found at the link below. This page is BJA's Central Performance Measures uh, website. Scroll through the list of programs where you will find the CSIF program. There you will find a PDF question questionnaire. Please use this to plan for your data collection.
The CSIF questionnaire includes three sections. The first is award administration, where you will simply indicate whether or not you have had grant activity and if you will be closing out your award. The next section is the new section that contains questions related to hiring. Lastly, you should be familiar with the last section, which are the seven narrative questions. General award information. This section consists of these two questions. Only answer yes to the first question for or last reporting period for which you'll have data to report when you are ready to begin the closeout process. The next question is related to whether or not you have had programmatic activity or grant activity during the reporting period. If you have not conducted or any planning or spent any grant funds, you can select no and pick from the list for the reasons that you do not have grant activity. If you select other, you will be required to describe uh, why in an open text box field. The CARES Act mandated that BJA gather information on the number of positions paid for with CSIF funds, if applicable. If grant funds are used to pay for a position such as a contact tracer, then that would be reported here. Please only report a position once. Do not report the same position in subsequent reporting periods. Lastly, please describe the roles and responsibilities of the position and whether it is a newly created position or a retained or existing position. You all by now should be familiar with these seven narrative questions. These questions are required after every reporting period. When responding to the narrative questions in the PMT, you will need to define the goals that you have for your program. Keep in mind goals should be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. It is good practice to review your goals on a regular basis and reassess how you are doing. Make sure to use data to describe how you are doing as well as anecdote that describes some of the good work you are also doing. For example, if you are using grant funds to purchase PPE and hire a part-time contact tracer, use data and anecdote to describe why those, why you had those needs and how those funds met those needs and the perceived impact of having the PPE, PPE and a contact tracer. Now let's take a quick look at the data that has already been reported. When looking at data reported after the first six months of grant activity, this table describes what the funds were used for most frequently and by whom. In total, 988 grantees completed the seven narrative questions and, and we analyzed those responses and categorized them accordingly. Now let's take a look um, at the table here. Overall, 40% or 386 grantees used funds to purchase PPE, which was pretty consistent across grantee types, except for states and tribes ter and territories, which were lower percentages. About 11% used, uh, or 113 grantees used uh, grant funds to purchase virtual equipment so staff could work safely at home and or remotely. Um, about 30% or 291 grantees have not used the grant funds um, or started spending down grant funds. And then about 19% or 192 uh, did not provide enough information for us to categorize. This last 20% of grantees did not provide enough information and these are the ones um, that could help BJA benefit more by providing more specific narrative information about their plan or goals for the use of the CSIF funds even if they haven't spent it yet. We would also like to share some tips to improve data quality that your program can do from the very beginning. It is recommended that a designated staff person coordinate all performance measure data collection and entry to ensure consistency. If this is the first time you will report data, make sure you are familiar with the data you will need to collect and report. Do this by reviewing the PDF version of the questionnaire that you can find at the website provided earlier. Ensure a backup person or persons are aware of the data collection and reporting process so that 
they can fill in if the designated staff person is unavailable or leaves the role. Consider available data collection methods such as databases, spreadsheets, tracking forms, or other methods. If partner organizations are included, determine if formalized agreements are needed to ensure the necessary data is collected and the program meets its goals and objectives. Should you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to the help desk. We will respond within 24 hours. Thank you all for your hard work and dedication to public safety. And now let me pass it to Amy Callahan and Bethany Case, where they will do a Just Grants demonstration. So I would love to share my screen with some folks. So um, my colleague Amy and I have the um, great pleasure of speaking to you all um, today a little bit about um, Just Grants. Um, but we only have, I think, about 15 minutes slotted. So I've, I'm, I'm sorry for that delay in, in my jumping on. We're getting lots of great questions in the Q&A um, section. So we're going to make this um, as short and succinct as possible and kind of direct you to resources that, that we know of. Um, let's see real quick. I had a whole bunch of things pulled up for you all. The first thing I wanted to start with was just to kind of give some context to what's going on. Um, so the department is transitioning, basically consolidating two grants management systems, the GMS, which OJP and OVW grantees were using, and NextGen, which COPS was using, we're consolidating, we have consolidated into one single grants management system. So, in, you know, this is good news because we are all now using one system which provides improved transparency and consistency in how we all operate, which um, as we all kind of grow accustomed to the system and as some of the kinks get worked out, it will save us all time and sanity in the long run. Right now it's a little tricky, right, because we, we launched and um, what I've learned, I'm a social worker by trade, is that, so I didn't know about technical projects and what the expectations should be, but what I've learned from my technical colleagues is that anytime a new system is launched, there's an expectation that there are gonna be bugs and malfunctions in the system, um, at least for the first few months. So what we're experiencing is apparently normal, but it's been really, it's been really challenging for all of us. Um, simultaneously, we also, um, transition from the grants payment grants payment request system, which is where you were drawing down funds previously if you're you're an existing grantee, to a government wide shared service called ASAP that's managed by the Department of Treasury. And why do we do this? Because it's free. It's a federal shared service. Um, and so that's what we've transitioned to. So it's a big deal. These kinds of transitions, I would say, like this transition to a grants management system happens once a decade to every 20 years. GMS is almost 20 years old. Um, and this, all this transition at once likely rarely happens. So it's a lot. We're all going through a lot. The good news is that um, much of this onboarding is temporary. Once you successfully get onboarded, you're in, and, and from there, it's just kind of managing things. So I wanted to kind of um, describe high level a couple, of, a couple of terms and give you, you know, maybe set some expectations. Um, our user support, uh, Amy and I do not represent user support. We're actually grant managers um, that work in uh, sister offices of BJA, but, um, and we are on detail to this project to try to shape Just Grants into making it what grant managers and grantees need it to be. So uh, I have great respect for our colleagues in user support and realized recently that there are only, there are less than 40 people working on user support. So that's not a lot of people responding to a whole lot of inquiries. So I know that one general, um, you know, issue that I've seen identified is a lot of frustration that Folks have reached out to user support and not gotten um, the response that they um, deserved or expected. And so I just wanted to kind of set expectations about the capacity that we're working with. So you all have, you know, are, are, are aware of that reality. Um, the other issue, 
let me see, is that we are onboarding all of our entities at once. We have more than 6,400 entities that the Department of Justice is doing business with. And so we are trying to onboard everybody at the same time. So you can imagine 6,400 entities with questions and seeking some, you know, one-on-one -on -one support is not very realistic for a user support team of 40. Um, so I just kind of, our, our model of providing training and assistance and support is really a, um, a self-guided uh, process. So I'm gonna direct you always to the Just Grants website, here it is, uh, where you can go and you can find all kinds, types of training materials. These videos are super short. They demonstrate specific parts of the system um, and they're like three minutes long, five minutes long, watch them. This might answer your questions. As well as the tools, um, kind of the reference tools um, that are developed to support you. So. My, I guess, advice to you is to try to see if you can answer the questions on your own by using the resources provided here on the Just Grants website. And then um, if you're really stuck, then save that for user support so that we can kind of bring down the, um, the flood of calls and emails so that we can really then be able to support people more deeply. But there are some other efforts underway to ramp up user support, um, but I just wanted you to kind of know realistically where we are right now. The other cool thing I wanted to show you real quick on the Just Grants website is that every single email that goes out to our, I mean, I think there are like 40,000 at least people that get these emails. Every single email is here on the website. So if you have a question about, say, ASAP enrollment, you can go to the website and and see, okay, this was the email that went out this summer <laughs> was telling my entity, hey, you need to go enroll in ASAP right now. Um, and so you'll get a lot of different updates. This is just a wealth of, um, of information here. So the next thing that I wanted to do for you real quick was just to do a quick demo. Um, but first I wanna start with, when we talk about onboarding, there was a very intentional decision made to, um, for onboarding purposes, we were going to use SAM.gov, which is the federal system, federal-wide system, kind of the clearinghouse um, for entities that are doing business with the federal government. And we said, hey, we are gonna use this as our source of truth for entity-level information. So what does that mean? That means we are going to SAM to look up, and sorry, I'm typing while I'm talking, but one of our colleagues on the phone, um, Anthony Wagner, who's asking me a question, I figured I might as well pull your entity up as an example. Um, this is a public facing website so anyone can go here and search for your entity. If you're kind of like, entity, what is, what is Bethany talking about? <laughs> it's basically your organization um, and, and how, are, how you are representing yourself to the federal government to, to do business. So, we're taking information, identifying information, like your DUNS number, um, your registration status, that kind of stuff directly from SAM. So you will never have to enter that into a system. We're connected to SAM to, to take that information. Another important um, piece right here for onboarding is that you all can look up if you have questions about like, gosh, what's the hang up? We use the entity's electronic business point of contact as the go-to person to onboard your entities. So if you're hearing crickets on your end, or you're like, uh, we haven't gotten any emails, or we haven't been able to log into the system, my first advice to you is to um, go to sam.gov, look up your entity, and see who your electronic business point of contact is. Reach out to that person and say, hey, I've been nosing around, um, you know, I, I'm working on a, DOJ or multiple DOJ grants, and we're having issues getting into our new grants management system. I went to this training and the person told me, you are, you've been getting all the emails. Um, you know, I would say check your junk folder, but all of the emails that they would have received, 
will be listed here on the website. So you can say like, hey, did you get this email in the summertime telling, saying that we need to go get um, enrolled in ASAP? So that's a good tool for you to use to kind of identify and connect with your entity's kind of gatekeeper. Now we use the electronic business point of contact for onboarding purposes only. So we um, send them an email to log into our secure user management system, which um, the acronym for that is DIAMOND. And it's there that the electronic business point of contact adds entity users. So they determine who from your entity needs to be added in, into the system, who they want to have access to entity level information, and they assign you roles or grant you roles that you might fulfill on specific awards within just grant. Um, and then you, like many of you have gotten those, that um, Diamond invitation, then you yourself go and log in through Diamond and you're able to get into just grant um, and see what you've been assigned and take those actions. Okay, so I'm gonna do a quick demo. It looks like I got logged out of the system, so I just am getting back in here real quick. This is an internal functionality that you're seeing. Um, and so I'm going to look up, for example, Anthony Wagner from Santa Barbara. Um, you asked me a question, and so I said, hey, Anthony, what's your DUNS number? And why? It's because it helps me look up this information very quickly. So I can see the city of Santa Barbara, and when I open this up, then I have a view similar to what your view is as an external user. So as an external user, you're not gonna have all the same stuff as me on your landing page, but you're gonna have this stuff along here. So you're gonna be able to see your entity profile. If you have ASAP related questions, what you're looking for here on your entity profile is a ROID number. This is an indicator to you that your organization, your entity has successfully registered in the ASAP system and you have this ROID, which is the, the identifier that they use. If you see a ROID is missing, that's the first clue to you. Hey, let me go to my entity administrator and figure out, have we completed this ASAP enrollment? Because um, our financial users initiate that enrollment, but then the entity has to do a, you know, their end to, to enroll themselves. And again, this is a one-time enrollment, so, it's a pain point, but once we all get across, you know, over the hump, we'll, we'll be there. Um, so from here, you'll also be able to see all of your entity users. And Anthony, I see that for your entity, you have two users. Um, and Lori is your entity administrator, which we saw from Sam. So we can see that that matched up to what Sam was telling us. And .gov. So um, you can view details about, you know, like contact information about this person, but since you work with them, you should already know that. One recent enhancement, um, and this is the entity administrators, you know everyone has this view of entity users. The roles that each person possesses are listed right here, and it can list multiple roles. So one problem that I see right here is, hey, they only have two roles assigned, and there are um, six roles. Um, so we need to be filling in the gaps. So one, one thing that I wanted to mention to you, Anthony, is, hey, ask Lori who else is going to be using the system, and we want to make sure that we get those folks um, assigned roles and get them logged in, or assign these roles to you or Ravori. Then I looked on your um, awards, which shows all of the awards that you have across the department. And I wanna see, okay, what are we missing? And we're missing some stuff here. We're missing, these are three required roles that must be assigned to every award. So this view helps me see, hey, right away, this is why nothing's happening because we can't, because um, these roles haven't been assigned. So you won't be able to do much in just grants until this happens. Um, another thing that I can see from this view is that the ASAP into the enrollment is kind of the status that your that your um, organization is in, which makes sense, right? Because we didn't see a ROID right here, so it makes sense. Hey, we're waiting on your entity administrator to finish 
or the financial folks um, who she's transferred that authority to to complete the enrollment. Um, another funny thing that I see here, um, Anthony, is that you have the role of application submitter only, but it looks like you snuck through the loophole here. We have this loophole that was open for about two weeks after go live that enabled the entity administrator to go assign um, work to people. Um, and it was making sure that they were a user in Diamond, but it wasn't checking to make sure that they had those roles. So because there's this mismatch, Anthony, because you don't have this role technically through Diamond, you really won't be able to do anything. So um, that's a little bit of troubleshooting um, kind of from a high level um, and, and just a general sense of what you should be, might be seeing and doing. Um, and if we have time later after Amy presents, then I could, you know, demonstrate a couple other ones that have asked me questions. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Perfect. Um, and can somebody make me the presenter now? This is Amy. Thank you. Okay. Um, I am going to log in here. Okay. I am just logged on as a user that has the financial manager role and the grant administrator role. Um, so in order to submit your FFRs, you need to have the financial manager role. And in order to submit your performance reports um, and your closeouts um, and GAMs, you're going to need to have a grant award administrator role. Um, when you log into Just Grants, um, you're going to have a work list. And your work list is um, where all of your items um, will um, populate where you have to take an action on. Um, so I have to caveat that I am currently in the test environment, so there is some um, funny data that we're going to see. Um, so don't pay too much attention to the data, but the functionality in production should work and the steps I'm going to take um, to get to items should work. Um, so in your work list, you're going to be able to come in here and look on case type. And, um, you know, you could filter by um, FFRs, um, you can filter by um, progress reports, closeout scams, et cetera. Um, when you get, oops, sorry about that. When you get into, um, when you filter down, you'll be able to see a list of the FFRs that are delinquent to you. If you click on this carrot here, you'll be able to see the report type and the award number. Um, and then when you open up the FFR, um, you are going to see um, the FFR, um, the FFR case. Um, one of the things that we are aware of is that the first FFRs in the performance report, so the first FFR that um, was due in July or had the end date of July, um, for some grantees, it's not populating in this work list. Um, and same with the performance reports. Um, so what you could do is you can click over here on your awards link, um, and there were many comments um, in the chat box or in the in the questions that were about this. So you could come over here to your awards um, and you can either sort by your award number and find your award. I have a specific award I'm going to go into. So I am going to sort by the FAW number and to sort, it's taking a little bit here. You should be able to come up here and just add the number. And this filter could apply to um, your award number as well. And you click on the funded award link over here. And 
And because I am in um, the testing environment, it is a little slow today. Um, here is where um, we are trying to improve this interface. But, um, and I think this is where a lot of the confusion is coming in. Um, to open the funded award to be able to take action on any of the items that are in here, you need to be able to open it up in this programmatic review right here. So um, this should be your name. I am default at DOJ. This is test data again. You should be able to see your name and you should be able to click the begin button. Once you click on the begin button, you're going to see um, the actionable um, funded award case. And when you come in here, um, you are going to be able to click on all these different tabs for your award. So um, your award package information will include um, your um, letter um, when you received your funds. And if you scroll down, um, you will be able to see um, when it was accepted um, and who accepted it. Um, your award conditions um, in this view, you will have a list of all your award conditions. You will also be able to identify if you are in compliance with those conditions, and you'll be able to identify the award amount that is withhold. Um, you'll also be able to see your award details, which includes your approved budget, um, which is down here, um, and your award attachments. Um, just moving over to FFRs, because this is where we started. You can come in here, and instead of seeing um, the view of prioritized items, here's where you see your view of the FFRs um, that need to be submitted. Um, so this FFR um, would be your first FFR that you need to submit. You'd be able to come in here, click on the FFR, and then you'd be able to move through the form. Um, so the form is a little different than what was in GMS. Oops, that didn't work. Sorry about that. Let's try this again. Okay. So the form is a little different than what is in um, GMS in that I'm going to try to go back again, sorry. I think I got a little click happy when I was trying to move through it. Um, Okay, so the first page of the form should just be your regular um, information that's pulled from your entity profile. So what we want to get to is the second tab of the form, and it's not working for me today. Okay, um, so you should be able to get to the second tab of the form and be able to complete your FFR. Um, from this screen, and I am not sure why it is not working in QA at the moment. Um, but you should be able to go through and um, submit the form, and one thing that is different for OJP and grantees is that you are submitting the cumulative amounts. Um, so in GMS, you used to be able to come in and submit your quarterly amounts, and um, and you'd be able to submit your quarter amounts and you would, um, then the system would calculate the um, cumulative amount, um, and that is currently not how this new system works. Um, so it is going to be um, your responsibility to come in and submit the cumulative amounts for the SFR. Um, so I'm going to go back into this award just to continue to move through 
the tab. So in the performance report tab here, um, we are going to be able to click on a performance report um, and um, fill it out. So for your first performance report that you are going to submit in Jeff Grants, you are going to attach a document and you will not have um, questions to be answered directly in here. So you're going to come up here, you're going to click on actions and performance report and then you are now in the performance report and you can come in and you can make edits. Um, in here, you should be able to come in. Um, if you want to change it to final, you can. Um, otherwise, it should be pre-populated to regular until it would be an appropriate final report. Um, you'd be able to come in here. You'd create your narrative and attachment um, as directed by your grant manager and by the program. Um, and you would be able to come in here and select um, a document and you can then attach the document. Um, and then you hit submit. And when you hit submit, um, it will go to the grant manager and the grant manager will um, review it and approve it. Approve it. And if, you have any, if they have any questions, they're going to change request it. Um, when they change request it, it's going to go back to that work list um, that is at the beginning of, at the home, at the home page. Um, if you have a GAM, and if you want to do a GAM, you're going to have to go into this awards link again. You're going to have to open this, hit this begin button. And then you're going to have to go into this GAM. Um, and when you click on the GAM tab, you will have the ability to come in here and select the type of GAM that you um, are needing to request. And you can come in here. Um, I'm just going to demo a budget modification. Um, you can come in here and create the GAM and then a new um, screen will pop up and it will kind of walk you through what you need to insert. Um, and then once you sit, submit the GAM, it will go to your grant manager um, for approval. Um, so just as an example, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to increase my amount. And um, I'm going to type my justification. Um, and then I'm going to hit submit, and it will go off to your grant manager. Um, in your work list here, um, I'm going to pull up an FFR from the work list. And Um, okay, so from your work list, you're going to want to come in here. Let's see if it works. Okay, so we got to the report information section. Um, so in here, um, you, here's your regular form. You, you're going to want to double check that you're in the right reporting period. Um, so what we are hearing from um, many people is that they tried to submit the report from 10-1 um, to December 31st, um, but you're, that's too early. Um, we wouldn't accept it. And you're thinking that you're in the 930 report. Um, if you can't find the 930 report in the work list, you're going to have to go to the awards and go open the award document and then go into the FFR tab to be able to submit an FFR. Um, in here, here's the cumulative. Um, here is where you would want to put in your cumulative expenditures. And um, you would also want to just come in here and, you know, make sure you put zero if you don't have any um, recipient share. Um, your award amount, which is 10D, that should be pre-populated. 
um, and your match amount should also be pre-populated. Um, and then you would be able to come in here. Um, you can add an indirect cost rate by clicking this Add button. You can delete it. You can add more than one indirect cost rate. Um, if you hit Continue, um, you will have a validation. I think I forgot to put whether it's cash or accrual. Um, and you can hit Continue. Um, you're going to have the ability to add any additional information. You can upload a supporting file. Um, I do know at one point this upload wasn't working, but I do believe that has been corrected. Um, and when you hit Finish, um, you'll see that your name is all pre-populated from your role and your role information. When you hit Finish, it will go off to OJP. Now, I do know that there is an issue um, regarding um, uh, the UFMS. So when you hit submit, um, when you um, hit submit, you're going to see this this um, status is going to change to UFMS pending. Um, and I am actually correctly getting this error because I am trying to submit an FFR for a report that is due or ending um, December um, of December 30th, 2020. Um, you will see an open, the, the new status would be UFMS pending. Um, once you submit it to us and it's UFMS pending, um, you should have no issues accessing your money or anything. Um, we consider UFMS pending as a submitted, a successfully submitted status. Um, so we are working through um, fixing that and we are hoping to have that fix deployed um, into production in the next couple of days. Um, so that's another issue that we are aware of. We are working on it, and um, we don't anticipate it affecting any of um, any of you um, drawing down funds. Um, and um, once the UFMS um, stage is completed, it will change to Resolve Completed, and Resolve Completed is um, a final FFR, um, and um, everything should be fine. If you go back to the home, um, we are going to come in here and we're going to pull up a closeout just real quick. Um, and there's one other thing that I want to show you. So here's your closeout. Um, for those of you who have been um, grantees in GMS, the closeout screen looks very similar to the old closeout screen. Um, and your award will automatically go into closeout um, when it is one day after the end date of your grant. Um, so the closeout case um, that I was trying to open will um, be populated in your work list. So I am going to come in here. Let's see if there's a closeout in here. Um, I'm going to pull it up. Um, and you're going to have all your general information about your award up front. Um, and if you scroll down, you're going to come in here and you can select your closeout type. Um, I am going to put compliant because while I'm in here, I'm going to try to come in here and resolve all these issues. So the screen shows you whether or not you have submitted your final FFR. It shows you whether or not you have financial reconciliation. Um, this would mean that you have drawn down the same amount of money that you have um, indicated as obligated in, in your um, 424. Um, you have also submitted your final financial report. 
your award conditions. It's going to be blank right here and your deliverables are going to be blank right here because an internal staff member will, a DOJ staff will then come in and mark whether or not you are complete and um, have completed these two items. Um, but you can come down here and this is where you can view all of the information. Um, so once again, if you um, have any deliverables that you want to um, submit to us, you can come in here, you can add your deliverables or any other documentation that your program office is requiring of you to submit um, for closure. Um, you also have the ability to come in here and look at your award conditions again. In this example, we do have some conditions. You can scroll down and you can look and see if you are in compliance and you know that because of this yes, there is this one no, so you would wanna come over here and um, if you hover over the condition, you'll see the full language of the condition um, and you'd be able to identify whether or not you have um, met um, that requirement. Um, I know, and then you can come in here and you can fill out your FFRs um, and you can also fill out your performance reports that are up here. Um, I know I took a lot of time there, so I think I'm gonna stop and see if there are any additional questions. So, um, I we were gonna go touch on some some Q and A's that we have identified and as frequently asked questions and are also posted on our CESIF FAQs on our webpage. Brittany, I don't know how we look on time. Um, I, I can certainly skip these, point out some additional resources. Um, we do have the BJA website here, points of contact. I know several of you have, eat, have um, asked questions in the chat about points of contact and how to get in touch with your grant manager. Um, you can access them through the link here. Um, we also have BJA NTAC for training and technical assistance and the FAQs, um, as I had previously mentioned. Um, some additional resources here, um, ASAP, OCFO, Grant Online Resources, Grants 101, Funding Resource Center, um, et cetera. And, um, Sorry, I kind of blew through that, but um, I did want to make note that, and I don't know, if, Brittany, you're probably going to mention this as well, but um, this presentation will be emailed out to invitees, and we also will get back to anyone whose questions were not answered in the Q&A. So um, thank you for all of those questions, and um, they will be answered. So um, thank you for that. And with that, Brittany, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you for wrap-up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, just one clarification that I wanted to make from Jimmy, and that is that the BJA CESS program is not in PMT, so you won't need to be uploading your January report. You will just be reporting directly in Just Grants. Um, and with that, I wanted to say thank you to all the presenters for their remarks, and thank you all for attending the Bureau of Justice Assistance Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding Grantee Training. As a reminding, reminder, this training was recorded and we will be sharing the recording and slides at a later date. If we are unable to get to your questions during the Q&A portion, we will follow up. Um, and also, Just Grants issues will be referred to our OJP targeted outreach team. Thank you again for attending and please enjoy the rest of your afternoon.